believe that there are some keys to getting prayers answered in the spirit. I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt, if you are tired of prayers being unanswered, you need to pay attention to what I'm preaching to you tonight because I'm going to give you something that gives you a key on how to get prayers answered from God. There was a very powerful prophet that lived back in the 50s and 60s, died way too young. His name was Verbal Bean. He was a very powerful man of God. He was a man of prayer. He, he was a powerful powerful man of prayer. He said there were two types of prayers that God answers. He said there are two types of praying that will get God's attention. He said the first type of prayer that God answers is a memorial prayer. It's something that you pray about over and over and over and then God answers it. He said like Cornelius when he prayed so many times that the angel of the Lord said your prayer and your giving has come up as a memorial before God. He said it was like this. He said, if a man wanted to buy a suit, but could not afford the suit, he would go into the suit store with the money he had and put the suit on layaway with the funds that he had. Next time he got paid, he would put some more funds down on the suit. He would not leave with the suit. He would leave without the suit each time he went in to make a payment. But the more payments he made on the suit, when he could make them, there would become a day when he would finally pay off the suit suit and when the last payment was made he could take what he had been paying for home with him he said that's how it is in your prayer life you can be praying about something over and over and over and not take the answer home if you keep praying and you keep believing there's gonna come a day when you bring the answer home with you because you've paid it in full hallelujah Thank you, Lord, for your wonderful grace, Jesus. We love you. We praise you, God. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you, God. Hallelujah. Oh, God, I thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your wonderfulness. I love you, my God. I love you, my God. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen, amen, amen. Well, it's great to be in the house of the Lord tonight. And uh, it really is so good to be back in Tyler, Texas. Tyler, Texas. Amen. First time I was ever in Tyler, Texas, it was because I got on the wrong airplane. And I thought I was going to Lake Charles. And they said, uh, they said we'll be in Tyler in 20 minutes. And... Uh, I was with Brother James Larson. He was going to Lake Charles. And I, so I said, uh, how long is the layover in Tyler? And they said, ain't no layover. It's the end of the line. And uh, we had to rent a car and drive on to Lake Charles. <laughs> and that's what happens when you don't pay attention. But now this is the third time uh, that I'm back. I was here with you a year ago. And we do count it an honor to be back with you. Amen. Tonight and in these anniversary services. It is an exciting time for you, an exciting time for all of us. It's an exciting time for the world. It doesn't mean it's all good excitement, but it is exciting. But this should be an exhilarating, fascinating, wondrous, wonderful, exciting time for the church of the living God. I'm glad to be alive only because I know Him and what He's doing. And He's doing great, 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 great things. Amen. I'd like you to, while you're standing with me, turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter number 12. I do want to say it's so good again to be with your wonderful pastor and his wife. These are really great people. And I want to say to the folks of this church, you are loved very much. You are loved very, 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 very much. And I uh, count yourself very fortunate that uh, you get the kind of care and word of the Lord and consideration that you get, really. Uh, your pastor is truly worthy of double honor. And his wife is probably worthy of triple. <laughs> Amen. Thank God. It's good to see Brother Watkins. God bless you. You have preached in Rialto. Uh, I didn't have the tape, so I just took care of it myself. <laughs> I 
on the strange ministers, brother, when you come to Rialto. Just keep that one to yourself. Praise God. And, uh, and it's so good to see Sister Wendell. God bless her. This is a great, great, great grand lady of the faith, and we do so appreciate her. So very, 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 very much. And uh, good to be with these ministering brethren here tonight. God bless you. Good to see Brother Prince again. God bless you so much. I want to uh, read, beginning at verse number 24 of Luke chapter number 12. There we find these words of the Lord Jesus. Consider the ravens. For they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Verse 27, Consider the lilies, how they grow, they toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed arrayed like one of these lilies. Amen. And I'd like for us to pray one more time that God would indeed grip our every heart. Speak to us, amen, as only He is able. Lord Jesus, we come to You, God. We very, very, very much recognize our need of You. We've got to have Your sweet unction, Your anointing that would rest, God, on Your servant and this people. Every man, every woman, every young person, yea, God, every child, give us ears to hear and a heart to understand Your gracious, lovely Word, Your truth, Your majesty. God bless every soul that You have brought into this house tonight. We commit this service into Your our hands in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you so very much. You may be seated. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. In the text that I have read to you, if you happen to have one of the editions of the King James Version, you know that, uh, and it is a red, what they call the red letter edition, that in this 11th and 12th chapter and in the 13th but especially the 11th and 12th you have a whole lot of red ink now his red ink is not like our red ink hallelujah when we run in the red it's because whatever but when uh, you're in your red letter edition and you got a lot of red there that's good news. Praise God. Amen. It's good news. Now, really, He gave us all of it. Every bit. But in these portions of the Word of the Lord, we find that these were the words spoken actually from the lips of Jesus Christ. And uh, there is not explanation given unless He gives it. There is not uh, any uh, uh, leading up to it, unless the gospel writer, as in this case Luke, uh, led you up to it with some understanding as to where they were, why they were there, etc., etc. In verse 22, he said unto his disciples, and then it begins to tell us what he said unto his disciples. He gives us many, many, many lessons in life. And in this case, he's telling us something exceedingly important about life. It was true in that day, almost 2,000 years ago. Well, I assure you, it is true today. All the lessons of this life that he gave us still pertain to you and I. 
We're in a different society. We're in a different time. We're in a different geographical location. But humanity is humanity is humanity. Heaven is still heaven. Hell is still hell. God is still God. The devil is still the devil. And people are still people. The needs are the same. The situations of the human heart, the conditions of the human heart are the same. And so His words to us are timeless. In this, He is telling us that uh, life consists more than just things that we possess or do not possess. He is letting us know that, that God takes care of His own. God takes care of ravens. God takes care, amen, of the flowers of the field. God takes care, amen, of the lilies, if you please. God takes care of His children. God takes care of His people. And brother, if you're going to pass through this life, you better be one of God's people. You need to be one of God's children. Hallelujah. And so He's letting us know... Amen. That we should not, in verse 29, be seeking for what we're going to eat or drink. Don't be worried or of doubtful mind. These are what the nations of the world, the heathen, the pagan, seek after. But rather, verse 31, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. If you put God first, He'll put you first. If you walk God's way... He will see that your way is kept. Hallelujah. If you do the things that God bids you do, then the blessings of the keeper, amen, of our hearts, minds, souls, yea, this world, yea, this universe, will keep us. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but it feels good to walk with Jesus. I don't want to be in this world five seconds without Him. I don't want to, I don't want to taste again, amen, what it was like to drink from the cup of hopelessness in the days before I knew God. God has been good to me. God has been good to us. There's got to be something that says, Lord, it's you first and last. You're the Alpha and Omega. You're the beginning and the end. You're the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords in my life. Hallelujah. Not everybody has that outlook. Not everybody has that consideration of God. But they are the losers for it. Amen. They are the losers for it. Amen. In a very brief condensation of all that he is stating, in the 27th verse, he gives us something to ponder, something to think about, something to compare, something to consider. When he said, consider lilies. And he said, boy, that's a big lead up for just that. But he did it. Consider the lilies. Amen. How they grow. They do not toil. They do not spin. And yet, I, the giver of life, The one that spoke these worlds into existence. The one whom John said he was in the world and the world was made by him. The one that made the lily. And the one, if you please, that made Solomon. Said, I say unto you that Solomon, King Solomon, glorious King Solomon, rich King Solomon, famous King Solomon, powerful King Solomon, in all of his glory was not arrayed like this simple plant, the lily. And Jesus, who was ever a, a, a drawer of pictures with words and a teller of stories and a giver of, of similes and parables and metaphors, now He's drawing a stark picture between a lily and a king by the name of Solomon. I, I do not know uh, across the length and breadth of this congregation, the the common knowledge of the lily or Solomon, either one. So I'm going to take the next little bit and talk to us about the difference between Solomon and the lily. And it's not hopefully wasted time because Jesus said to consider the lily. And when he spoke of Solomon, he obviously wants us to consider Solomon in all of his glory. That as yet for all of that, he was not arrayed like 
is the lily. Who is this Solomon? He was the third king of Israel. His father David reigned for 40 years. The one that David took his place was King Saul. He reigned for 40 years. Solomon reigned for 40 years. These men were distinct in their own right. I believe that they were types within types. And that's another study. But I think that Saul was a type of the law. It started out well, but it ended up with a curse. And and David was a type of grace of the church age. And, and all you got to do is do a little cursory study and understand that David was so much a type of the church. God let him do things that we do in the New Testament church that wasn't even spelled out in the Old Testament. It wasn't even spelled out in the law. And yet this man was so linked up, amen, to a dispensation that God raised him up and used him. And I believe David's reign is a type of the church age in many regards. And then Solomon, his 40-year reign in one aspect is a type of millennial reign because it was so glorious, because it was so unbelievable, because it was so powerful, because it was so wondrous and stupendous, amen. And yet... The man himself ended up on a sad, sad note. This man, who as a, as a young man taking the throne, and God appears to him in a dream, in a vision of the night, and asks him, what wilt thou that I should do unto thee? Now I'm going to tell you something. He wasn't getting a call from his local banker. He wasn't getting a call from a friend across the street. What can I do for you? He wasn't getting a call from his father-in-law. Hallelujah. What can I do for you? He wasn't getting a call from an older or younger brother. Solomon got a call from God Almighty. What can I do for you? (laughs) Man, give me time to think. Hallelujah. But he said, teach me how to go out and come in before this great people and to judge your people Israel. And he said, because you have asked for this and not for the lives of your enemies and not, amen, for long life and not for great riches, etc. He said, I'm going to give you everything you didn't ask for plus that. And so God began to bless this man, Solomon. We have to consider this man, Solomon, in all of his glory. We will not read this. Trust me. Amen. When I tell you, it is here. In 1 Kings chapter 4 through verse, or through chapter 10. If you want to read it after church tonight, read about Solomon in all of his glory. You will find there that this man amassed a herd of horses, if you please. Amen. Of 40,000 horses. I had three horses one time. And I know what the hay bill was for three horses. I can't even imagine what it was to keep them stocked in fodder. Hallelujah. Food. 12,000 charioteers. Amen. 1,400 of that mass amount of chariots were covered completely with gold. Now when this man came out with his chariots, his horsemen, amen, led by a procession of 1,400 gold-covered chariots, brother, it was an impressive sight. When you go outside of a mall and you look at, at a load of cars out on a huge mall sometime, stop and think if every one of them was gold-plated. And you can, and one man owned them. You would begin to understand, amen, the glory that was Solomon's, amen. He was not only blessed materially, financially, but he was blessed with great wisdom. The Bible said that he had wisdom that was greater than all of the kings and the wise men of the East. To the place, the Bible tells us, that kings and wise men from around the world would come and sit in the court of Solomon, not to talk to him, just to listen to him. And the wisdom that proceeded out 
of his mouth. It says his wisdom excelled the wisdom of the children of the east country and all the wisdom of Egypt. God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much and largeness of heart even as the sand of the seashore. For he was wiser than all men and his fame was in all nations round about. Consider Solomon in all of his glory. This man that had and in this day uh, uh, this was uh, God told kings not to do this. This is part of his undoing. But he did wink at polygamy in those days. But let me tell you this. Everywhere you find it in Scripture, it caused headache, heartache, sorrow, broken families, and people were lost over it. Every situation. Well, this man Solomon, if numbers of wives in that time was some kind of a criteria of greatness. The Bible said he had 300 of them and 700 concubines. wonder how much it cost to feed them. <laughs> but he did. And his servants and his household, the Bible said, was so great, the way that his household was fed was that while there were 12 tribes in Israel, besides the tribe of Levi that did minister the priesthood because the tribe of Joseph was broke up in Ephraim and Manasseh. That these twelve tribes, it was their job. There were key men picked out of those tribes. And they were to oversee that for 11 months out of the year, the tribe of Asher would go and work and do and produce and, and, and garner and gather. And, and they'd work with in, in husbandry and agriculture. And, and, and after 11 months of labor, for one month out of the year, their job was to feed the house of Solomon. After that month was over, they'd step back. They'd go back to work for another 11 months. And then the tribe of Zebulun, after 11 months, would come in and feed. And when Zebulun was done, the tribe of Gad would come in and feed. And when Gad was done, the tribe of Reuben would come in and feed. I'm trying to explain to you the glory that was Solomon's house. Amen. The power, the fame, the majesty. And yet Jesus said, I'm telling you, a lily is arrayed with greater glory than Solomon. When we talk about this man, Solomon, whom the Bible said that 666 talents of gold flowed into his coffers every year in the neighborhood at about $350 an ounce, one billion two hundred seventy-eight thousand seven hundred and twenty thousand dollars Every year. And those was the days, folks. A billion dollars was a billion dollars. You got the picture? Hallelujah. This man was so rich. He was so wealthy. When the queen of Sheba came, and she had heard of the fame, the wisdom, the glory of Solomon, she amassed together a caravan, if you please, of all of the riches of Sheba. The gold, the spices, the peculiar treasures. Amen. And she came in bearing gifts and 120 talents of gold by herself. She was going to put on the dog and show this bumpkin from Israel how people lived on the other side of the tracks. And when she came in to the kingdom of Solomon, the Bible said when she saw his apparel, and she saw his house, and she saw the temple, and she saw the attendance of his ministers, and she saw the servants and the glory and the joy that was on him, the Bible said her spirit left her. I don't know if she was just so puffed up she got puffed down. I don't know if she fainted, but brother, somewhere she parked herself and said, I thought I knew something about glory. I am just nothing but Ned in the first reader. I had no idea. And she said, Solomon, when I was told of the glory of your house, I did not, frankly, I did not believe it. And now that I've come and now that I've seen, she said, the half was not told me. 
So my little ditty here tonight, trying to explain Solomon in his glory, will not get the job done. This man that assembled together a temple that was so magnificent that it took 10,000 men 11 years just to cut the lumber. And then it took 150,000 men 7 years just to assemble this temple of wood and stone and gold and silver and jewels, amen, that had in it 108,000 talents of gold and one million seventeen thousand talents of silver this this great temple amen that if it were tried to build solomon's temple today in exact replica of gold and silver and precious stones it would cost in a minimum of around 83 to 85 billion dollars to build Solomon's temple. And it took him seven years, 150,000 men to assemble it. And yet, the Bible says, it took the same man 13 years to build his own house. Consider Solomon in all of his glory. When they dedicated the temple, this man stands he begins to utter the longest prayer we find anywhere in the Bible. He begins on his feet and he ends on his knees. He is praying to God and in the presence of about five million Israelites. The Bible said of the oxen and of the sheep that were offered that day to Jehovah God, they could not be numbered for multitude, but it does give us the number that Solomon had offered out of his own private personal stock from his herds alone. One man's, let alone the rest of Israel, was offered 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep from his herds. And he had lots left over. Consider Solomon. The world has never seen the likes of Solomon before or since. Croesus was a joke compared to Solomon. E. Howard Hunt was a joke compared to Solomon. Howard Hughes had nothing compared to Solomon. I'm telling you, Bill Gates on his best day could not compare a man to what Solomon possessed and Solomon did and Solomon had. Do you understand this man? For once and for all time, God chose a time and a place and He raised up a man as a sign to every generation that would ever live. Nobody will outdo Solomon. Nobody will outgain Solomon. Nobody will outget Solomon. Nobody will outpossess Solomon. Nobody will outknow Solomon. Nobody will outdo him in fame and grandeur and glory. He raised up for once and for all a man that nobody could ever compare to. Amen. Strive to be like God did it. God raised him up. And then we see all the good that it did him. Like A.E. Hausman said, fame in itself is really nothing. But it's a nice mattress between oneself and the cold, hard ground of reality. All of his riches was just a mattress between him and the cold, hard, brutal facts of reality. It is appointed unto man once to die, and then cometh the judgment. This once great, mighty, powerful, glorious man, before it's over, something has happened to Solomon. Before it's over, something has given way in Solomon. Before it's over, all of these wives and all of these concubines have turned his heart. The Bible said he was great, but he loved many strange women. And before it's over, this once great man, we find him groveling before dumb idols that cannot speak and cannot hear, crawling through his massive gardens 
hands at night, worshiping the gods of Chemosh and Ashtaroth, the gods of Moab. This man that was so great, he's now an egotist. He's now a sensualist. He's now an idolater and a cynic and a skeptic and a tyrant and a slave to those wicked women. He's a disenchanted, satiated, prematurely old, disappointed fool. And all of his riches and all of his glory and all of his pomp and all of his grandeur does him no good because he writes 36 times in 12 chapters. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. All is vanity and vexation of spirit. Amen. Thirty-six times He lets us know how really miserable He is. With much knowledge, He said, there comes much sorrow. He finally comes to the place in 2.17 of the book of Ecclesiastes. He says, therefore, I hated life. So Jesus said, consider Solomon in all of His glory. But I'm going to tell you, he didn't have it as good as one of God's lilies. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 4. Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he knoweth, And understandeth me, that I am the Lord, the Lord that executeth love and kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth. In these things I delight, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter how much money you have or you do not have. It doesn't matter if the whole world knows you or nobody knows you. What matters is, brother, do you understand and know the Lord? Are you in God's earth? Amen. Living for Him. Serving him, walking with him, trusting with him, worshiping him, believing in him, obeying him. If you are, he said, you are arrayed more and greater than Solomon in all of his glory. Consider the lily. The lily. The lily. Consider the lily. I want to take just a moment and talk about the lily. One of the first things, so obvious, you're going to say, Larry Booker, I didn't come out here to have my intelligence insulted. But the first thing about a lily, (laughs) lilies unlike Solomon and gold-paved rooms and jewel-studded beds, gold-covered chariots, men running before him according to Talmudic tradition, a man with gold dust sprinkled in their hair, which is where he picked it up from his brother Adonijah, but he did one better. He sprinkled gold in the hair of the people that ran before him. Talmudic tradition. And here, this man, in all his glory, while a lily grows in the dirt. Boy, that's really deep, Larry Booker. It is very obvious. But Jesus said, you are in this world, and this is a dirty world. This is a painful world. This is a sorrow-filled world. This is a sin-filled world. In any given amount of dirt, it is highly germ-infested. But can I tell you something? He said, you're in the world, but you're not of the world. Hallelujah. A lily grows in the dirt, but brother, lilies don't look like a dirt ball. 
We may be in this world, but we don't have to look like the world. Hallelujah. We don't have to live like the world. We don't have to be infested and infected like the world is. It's not that we're any better than anybody. By the grace of God, if we're anything tonight, He did it. His mercy, His love, His grace, His truth, His church, His kingdom. Hallelujah. Amen. Lilies are in the dirt, but they don't look like the dirt. We're in this world, but by the grace of God, we've been washed. We've been sanctified. We've been cleansed. He did it by the Spirit of our God. Hallelujah. In the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Amen. I'd rather be a lily in this world than be like Solomon in all of his glory. To die disenchanted and disappointed and disillusioned. Just let me walk with you, God. Let me be sensitive to you, God. Hallelujah. This is why the writer, and it was not Solomon, said, Let me be neither too rich nor too poor. I don't want to be so rich that I forget you, God. And I don't want to be so poor that I steal and forget my Maker. Just somewhere out there, God, keep me going. Keep me loving you. Keep me walking with you. Let me serve you and be exactly what you want me to be. We're in the world, but we don't work like, think like the world, live like the world, and act like the world. Another thing about lilies is they can grow, and they do grow anywhere There's plant life. Literally, you can find lilies in the tundra regions of Canada, as well as the swamp areas of Florida and Louisiana. You can find them, amen, in Arctic Siberia. And you can find them in the Andes Mountains. Anywhere a plant will grow, a a, a, a plant, if a plant can grow there, a lily can grow there. Solomon can't live just anywhere. You take him out of his courts. You take him out of his robes. You take him out of his situation, brother, and he ain't going to do so hot. But you can take a child of God. They can make it anywhere. They can live for God in any climate. Hallelujah. They can live for God in any situation. Hallelujah. They can live for God. It doesn't matter what part of the world. In every kindred, nation, people, and tongue, God is going to have a church. God is going to have a people. One of these days when the trumpet sounds, there's going to be a number from out of the grave. Amen. And those that rise to meet Him in the air. That John said, a man cannot number for multitude of every nation, kindred, people, and tongue. Solomon, there's just one certain climb you can exist in, but a lily can make it anywhere. Hallelujah. You can live for God with a good boss. You can live for God with a bad boss. You can live for God with a million dollars in your bank account, and you can live for God without two nickels to rub together. You can live for God if you're healthy. You can live for God if you're sick. You can live for God through anything if you'll just walk with Him. Hallelujah. He's made a plan. He's got it written out. It's down on black and white. Brother, forever settled in heaven. He will never put more upon you than you can bear. You can make it. You can make it. You can make it. Climate's too whole, cold. Climate's too hot. Problem's too big. Amen. Blessing's too small. It doesn't make any difference. I can make it. I can make it. I can make it. Why? Because I'm a Solomon. No! I'm a lily. And the glory of a lily. Solomon can't hold a candle to it. Furthermore, under the right conditions, lilies grow prettier. More of a rich hue. Fullness. Somehow a depth. Every year. Amen. So how do you know that? I checked a book out of the library. I am not a horticulturalist. Amen. I'm not, uh, I'm not a botanist. But I can read. Hallelujah. And according to the experts, if you take care of a lily, you make sure they get this proper sunshine and rain. Hallelujah. And nutrients. There's something about them. They can grow richer, more beautiful every year. 
Hallelujah. There's something about a child of God. Don't don't ever let the devil sell you the bill of goods. Well, I've been living for five years. I guess I've peaked out. Or 25 or 35. I'm telling you, you keep in the sunshine and the rain of His love. Brother, you keep your ear uh, uh, to the to the Word of Almighty God. You walk with the, the, the footsteps of the flock. You stay faithful to the church of the living God. I don't care if you're five years old or 95, brother. You can have a richer life every year. It can take on hues and colors and depths in the Spirit. Amen. That you never know. It doesn't matter. Brother, you can be learning every year. People say, I'm too old to learn. Then you're too old to live, brother. I'm here to tell you, you can learn something about Jesus every day. Every, I don't care if you live 10,000, thousand years. There's no end to Him. There's no end to His magnificence. There's no end, hallelujah, to His blessing. He is the Almighty, eternal God. The Bible says of the increase of His government, there shall be no end. The second law of thermodynamics, it may affect GM, brother, and GM will come down someday. The second law of thermodynamics that says everything runs its course and runs down eventually. It did happen with Greece, and it did happen with Babylon, and it did happen with Persia, and it did happen with Rome, and we have seen it happen with Great Britain, and already the entropy has started in on the United States of America. But I've got something for you tonight. There is a kingdom, brother, the increase of his government. There is no end. There is no end. There is no end. This kingdom through the ceaseless ages, it's just somehow going to get bigger and bolder and more beautiful and more sweet. We're going to understand more about Him when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. There's no less days to sing God's praise. Brother, we've just begun. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'd rather be a lily than Solomon any day. Lilies are different from poinsettias. I lean on your knowledge of poinsettia. That's the red flower people see around Christmas time. Poinsettias are like, here I am. Look at me. <laughs> Hallelujah. A lily's not like that. A lily has a calm grace about it. He said, well, you people don't look very calm to me. (laughs) Well, when it comes to loving Him, no, we do get excited. I'll grant you, brother. I love Him. He's great and greatly to be praised. Psalms 47 and 1 says, clap your hands, all your people. You want to know why we clap our hands? Because he said, clap your hands, all your people. The Bible says, shout unto the Lord with a voice of triumph. You want to know why we... Precious Father, we're so glad to be in your house today. Feel you. It's good to be here. You know my idea of church before I got the Holy Ghost? I would go. I never understood what any preacher ever said. Not one time ever. I had no idea what they were talking about. I'm not sure they did. (laughs) Nothing gripped me. Nothing grabbed me. I was so bored I couldn't stand it. And I kept thinking, this is so tedious. You know... Einstein said relativity. Someone said, explain to me relativity, theory of relativity. He said, well, okay, let's just put it like this. He said, this was his words, ten minutes on a park bench with, or one hour on a park bench with a beautiful girl goes like that. Ten minutes on a hot stove goes on forever. (laughs) Hallelujah. One hour in a one God, Jesus name, apostolic, Holy Ghost filled church goes like that. Yeah. Ten minutes in them places I used to go. And I thought if I make it an hour, I have paid for all my sins this week. But brother, it's not that way here. Woo! 
He's a good God. He's a great God. He's worthy of praise. He's worthy of our love. He's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our adoration. We'd rather be a lily amen, than Solomon in all of his glory. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. There's a lot of things in the world that are called lilies that are not lilies. Anybody ever hear of the water lily? Lily of the Nile? Amazon lily? And there's 103 other things in this world called lilies that are not lilies. The Amazon lily, the real name is Eucharist Grandiflora. Lily of the Nile is Zandadesia. The water lily is an acampathus. And 102 more other things called lilies, but they're really not lilies. If you're going to be a lily, you got to look like a lily. you got to live like a lily. You've got to grow like a lily. You've got to have the appearance of a lily. Or you're something else. There's a lot of people who call themselves Christians. And there's more than 102 of those. But I'm going to tell you, there's a difference between Christianity and churchianity. Hallelujah. If, I got, if I'm getting into this, I want to do it right. I remember one time I was a drunken fool. I was on probation from the time I was 15 to I was 21. Uh, I was from my ninth grade year till the year after I graduated. I was high, drunk or high every single day except for one six-week period of time. And, uh, and, and, and there I was. And I remember one time standing up on a football field and, and, uh, and me and another drunk buddy, and we, we was up there because we got kicked out of the prom and, and, uh, and we're standing up on this football field and, and there I was. I was the biggest bum in the school. I, 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 I was not vulnerable. Are the most likely to succeed, okay? <laughs> and I stood there and I looked at the stars and I have no idea why I said it. I said, Eddie. He said, What? I said, Just think one God made all this. I have no idea why I said that. He said, yeah, he did. He said, but, he said, you know, really, there's three. He said, there's three, man. Three what? There's three gods. There is not three gods. Oh, yeah, there's a Father, and there's a Son, and there's a Holy Ghost. Wow. Who told you that? He said, man, that's Bible. I said, all I know is if I ever live for God, I'm going to live for God the way the Bible says to do it. Why am this conversation ever got started? <laughs> Only God knows. He said, well, that's Bible. He said, but Larry, I'm going to tell you something. If you really check it out and you really study it, he said, there's really five gods. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, I got news for you, brother. There is not three gods. Deuteronomy 6 4. She might always hear loud and well, he might know he could. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hallelujah. Isaiah 43 11. I, even I, am the Lord. Beside me, there is no Savior. Hallelujah. Woo, praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Colossians 2 9. For in Him, Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. Finally, you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. Amen. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Amen. John 12, 44. He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. Verse 45. He that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. Amen. Amen. Philip answered him and said, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. He said, Philip, have I been so long time with you, and yet thou hast not known me? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. I'll say this now then, show us the Father. Don't you know... I'm in the Father, and the Father's in me. For the Father that dwelleth in me, He doeth the works. How much of the Father's in Him? Colossians 1.19 For it pleased the Father that in Him should all 
holiness dwell. First Timothy 3.16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, believed on in the world, preached unto the Gentiles, and received up into glory. Second Corinthians 5.19, to it God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Brother, he's a father in creation. He became son or flesh in redemption. He pours out his spirit and we call it the Holy Ghost. But brother, it's not three gods. It's one God that did it all. Hallelujah. Amen. Acts 4.12. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Hallelujah. Woo! Brother, if I'm going to be a lily, I'm going to be a lily. I'll take on the name of Jesus. I will receive the Spirit of Jesus. I will walk in the truth of Jesus. Woo! Hallelujah! God bless you. i got to keep moving. A lily is never, everybody say never, never. dormant. Never. You don't have to replant lilies every year. You just plant them once. And every year they spring back. You say, don't tell me when there's a foot of snow on the ground and it's covered with ice that that lily's growing. Lilies are never dormant. Bless her. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lilies and kids are never dormant. Hallelujah. (laughs) Lilies are never dormant. It doesn't matter how cold it is. It doesn't matter if it's blizzard conditions. Those roots, something is always happening. You say, Pastor, I'm in a cold time of my life. It feels bad. It feels cold. I don't think I'm growing. I got news for you. You're growing more than you think you are. Hallelujah. It's some of these winter seasons that our roots really start doing some things. It may not look much on the surface, brother, but there are things happening down inside of you in the midst of that trial, in the midst of that turmoil, through those tears, brother. There is something happening because lilies are never dormant. They're always moving. They're always growing. There's always something happening in the spirit realm. Furthermore, lilies... Multiply. They multiply. You plant a lily. A couple of them. Come back a couple of years later. There's more lilies. Hey, did you plant more lilies? No. They just multiply. And then you get some more. And then you get some more. Lilies multiply. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you something about the church of the living God. It multiplies. It multiplies. Hallelujah. Lilies beget lilies, brother. And and we just grow and we grow and we grow. God knows how to do it, brother, with this kingdom of Almighty God. Furthermore, lilies are not, literally not bothered by as many insects as other flowers. Literally. Bugs that bother, bother other flowers when they go to the lily they just keep on trucking hallelujah doesn't mean they're not bothered but they're not bothered by as many insects I remember the days my pre-lily days my weed days when I would be in car and look in my rear view mirror and see a police car in my mirror and immediately I'm my mind's racing from the bumper to the back bumper. What have I got hit in this car? 
bothered picking up the phone, hearing little funny clicks and noises because my phones were tapped and, 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 and being patrolled around the streets as the police would follow me. And, and sometimes I was glad they were because I knew if they were following me, other guys that was out to do me in wouldn't get too close and things of that nature. I was bothered by all kinds of pests and all kinds of bugs flying around my head and in one ear probably and out the other. And there was my life and there was my world. But brother, one day I found an altar and I found a place to repent and I found a pond and I was baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of my sins. And five nights later I received the gift of the Holy Ghost. I'm not going to tell you I've not had any problems or trials, but it isn't anything like what it used to be. Hallelujah. I've lived for God 28 years now, and i got news for you. Since the day I repented and was baptized and got the Holy Ghost, I have not had one, not one, bad day. Not one! Now, I've had some that was better than others. But I would rather take my worst day with God than my best day in Solomon's courts without God. I'd rather be a lily in the frozen tundra covered with ice and have my roots doing something than to be in the courts of the wicked. Amen. Walking without God. I've not had a bad day since I started walking with God. Some a whole lot better than others. But brother, a day in His presence is better than a thousand in the courts of the wicked. Consider Solomon in all of his glory. I'm telling you, he was not arrayed like one of these lilies. Let's lift our hands and love you. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your grandeur. Thank you, God, for your kindness. Thank you, God, for your goodness. Hallelujah. 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 There is a fallacy about lilies. It is found among the ranks of amateur gardeners that lilies are a weak plant. There's not much fabric to them. There's not much stock to them. There's not much staying power to them. That is believed by amateurs that really don't know their gardening or the status of lilies. Lilies are considered some of the sturdiest, stoutest, strongest plants of that realm. There is a common fallacy that you have to be some kind of a weak-kneed, willy-nilly to become a Christian. They couldn't make it because they needed a crutch. So there they are. My answer to that is, sir, any old dead fish can flow with the currents of this world. Go to the places, the abodes, live the lifestyles, follow the patterns, the fads. Amen. Get caught up in the language, the entertainments that this world has to offer. But I'm going to tell you, it takes a fish of a different stroke. Amen. To fight the waves and the stream and the current and say, I'm not headed that way. I'm going upstream. I'm spending my life. I'm going upstream. There is a fallacy that, that lilies are some kind of a weak, sissy plant. I remember being 17, 18 years old. I'd sit in the house with my father. I remember my, my, my father, he's into Eastern religion mentality. Not a practicing Buddhist but, or Eastern religions, but he's, his mind's out there. Very brilliant man. Very brilliant man. Very self-taught man. But he just, he just followed the wrong stuff. But I remember talking to him sometimes till 2 in the morning about the things of God in my ignorance and his ignorance. I remember one day him getting himself so worked up and excited, he got up out of his chair and he says, The Bible says the meek will inherit the earth. I'm here to tell you, they ain't going to get nothing. You've got to get out and grab it. Well, that wasn't exactly Zen Buddhism talking, but it's what he said anyway. And I didn't know nothing about nothing. But I did say this, you know, Dad... I don't think you can be a weak person and be a real Christian. And since then, I know there's a common fallacy 
among people that don't know God or His people. But to live for God, you got to be some kind of a sissy. i got news for you boys. It takes more guts to stand against the tides and the currents and the fads and the fashions of this world and say, brother, for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. You can talk like that if you want to. You can go watch that if you want to. You can live like that if you want to. But for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. Amen. While Daniel's world was eating the king's meat that had been sacrificed to the king's gods, Daniel purposed in his heart, I will not defile myself. That's not a weakling, sir. That's somebody that's got conviction. That's somebody that knows God. That's somebody that's got it deep in their heart. Hallelujah. I ain't living like that. I'm not walking like that. Let's stand tonight. How hardy, how sturdy, how strong are letters. Brother Zorch, when I read this, I'm telling you, I about did a handspring. Did you know that you can plant a couple of lilies in a thorn-infested area? And if you'll just see to it, they get water and sunlight. They will grow. They will multiply. And lilies have the power to choke out thorns. Jesus spoke of that which was sowed and the thorns of this life, the cares of this life, choked it out. We are in a society. You talk about Solomon and all of his glory. Get it now. Get it and grab it and, and live it. And, and if you've got to go to huck, amen, and huck your, up to your eyeballs to get it, do it now because this is the Pepsi generation. And the cares of this life sucking down a nation. But lilies have the power to grow in the grace of Almighty God and choke out the cares of this life. Choke out the thorns and say, no, Solomon, it got you. You strangled on the cares of this life. It choked you down to where you said you hated life. But for me and my house, hallelujah, the cares are going to be choked out by the grace of God and the goodness of God, the glory of God, the love of God, the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and the help of the man of God. We're going to choke those things out. I'd rather be a lily. I'm closing. The lily is the plant. That long-stemmed, several-leafed plant that has the beautiful white six petals. Amen. With the gold pods on the inside. Hallelujah. My. Six of them are gold and one of them is green on the inside. It's the ones that we see in the springtime get delivered to a lot of places. That's the lily. You may think I'm going out on this limb too far. But Jesus said, come on, think about the lily. How it's arrayed, how it grows. Solomon in all his glory is not clothed and arrayed like one of these. Six is the number of man. White bespeaks the color of righteousness. By God's grace, a lily, the outer man, walks in the righteousness of Almighty God. But the real beauty of a saint of God is not that outward adorning or even lack thereof. It is the hidden man of the heart. You've got to look down. You've got to tilt it up and take a view on the inside to see the real beauty and glory of the lily where there are seven pods inside and six of them are gold because down on the inside you want to see our glory. It's not I, but Christ. It's not the outer man that perishes day by day, but it's the inward man that is renewed 
day by day. That gold is the type of divinity. The spirit of all that. How are we arrayed with the fine linen righteousness of the saints of God? How are we clothed with the glory of God from the inside working its way out? Hallelujah. Seven is the number of this great redemption. I'm glad it's inside of me. I'm glad I've got it. Consider Solomon in all of his glory. I'm telling you, he has nothing to compare to a lily that does not spin, does not toil. It just grows by the grace of Almighty God and it overcomes. Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands and love it. I love you, Jesus. 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 I love you. We're in a world where people go crazy after media models. Hollywood stars, sports figures, the rich, the famous, the powerful, the pompous. Amen. Can I tell you where heaven's looking tonight? To this man will I look, even to him that is of a poor and contrite spirit and tremble at that, my word. He's looking at Lily's brother. That's why in the book of Hosea, he said, I will cause them to grow as the Lily. He's going to help us. The Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 1. Whither is thy beloved gone? So where, O oh bride, where, O oh Shulamite maiden, where is your king? Where is your beloved gone? O oh, thou fairest among women. O oh, thou fairest among women, where is your beloved and where is he gone? Whither is thy beloved turned aside? Whither has your God, if you please, turned aside? That we may seek him with thee. We want to seek that God with you. My beloved is gone down into his garden. You want to know where you're going to find God? He's in the garden. To the beds of spices. God's come down to the bed of spices. To feed in the garden. He's come here to the garden to feed tonight. And to gather lilies. And one of these days, he's coming to the garden for the last time. And every real lily on the face of the earth, he's taking them home, brother. He's going to gather his lilies. He's going to take them out of this world. I want to be in that number, don't you? I don't want to be a rose tulip chrysanthemum, some man said glory winner, man planted, pampered, plotted and plucked in a house of glass or a sweet one's garden. I want to be a lily! I want to be what God wants me to be. I want to do what God wants me to do. Because he's coming into his garden one of these days. And he's going to take his lilies out of here. And I want to be in that room. Consider the lily. And brother, when we rise to meet him in the air, we're going to be changed. We're going to see him as he is. We're going to be made like him. Solomon, where is your pomp now, sir? Where is your glory now? What are you going to do now that it's over? How did it feel, Solomon, to give up the ghost? To kiss it all goodbye? To say vanity of vanities for the last time? While Jesus is going through his garden and he's gathering his lilies and taking them home to be with him forever in glory. I don't know about you, if I was here tonight and I was a dandelion, I think I'd change ours. I'd say, God, come on now. I want to be what you want me to be. I want to do what you want me to do. Let's lift our hands. Anybody here want to pray tonight? Is there any lilies here want to say, God, thank you for your great salvation? 
I want to be everything you want me to be. I want to do everything you want me to do. Is anybody here tonight? Maybe you've looked around and decided, you know, I've spent too many wasted days. I went too far. I want to know him from the power of his resurrection. I want to be changed. I want the name of Jesus. I want the spirit of my God. I'm opening up this altar tonight. It's for anybody. It's for everybody. It's for the lost. It's for the thankful. It's for the hopeful. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter where you are. Doesn't matter where you come from. Doesn't matter what you've done. There's a God here tonight. He wants to take you home, sir. He wants to take you home, man. He wants to give you a new name. He wants to give you a new destiny. He wants to give you a new future. second type of prayer is a current prayer. He said a current prayer is the second type of prayer that God answers. It's, it's a situation that you do not have, you don't have a long time for God to do this. You need God to do it now. Does that make sense? Yeah, you, you can have a lost loved one. You can, that's a memorial thing. You just pray until God does something. But you could have a situation where you need God to intervene now. And when you have that type of prayer, memorial prayer is not what you need. You can't just go bring the name up or bring the situation up in passing and say, God, I'm making another payment on this. I need you to come through. When the situation is desperate, it requires desperation in your prayers. A current prayer. You can't come with a situation, Brother Grant, that's tragic and real and severe and come to God and give God a, you know, Lord, what we're going through right now. And I need you to come through because the deadline is this week and we have to an answer. We need some peace. We need a miracle and walk out. That's, there's no desperation there. You're giving God the right facts, but you're not giving God the heart behind the facts. You're showing God, I'm really not serious about this. Because a current prayer requires desperation. It requires you to be, I need an answer now. I don't have 60 years to pray about this. We need a miracle in our house. That is desperation. That's a current prayer. And a current prayer, God will hear. And I want to show you something. That, that the Lord answers prayers while you're praying them. I know that we've got God in this box that if I pray today, he can come through by Thursday or he can come through by tomorrow. He can come through by next month. But actually God, the Bible said, I can hear you before you even say what you're going to say. In fact, I need Jesus. I know what you're saying before you even ask.